Hello, welcome to this evening's TI Technology Webinar hosted by Texas Instruments, where we will take a look at how to learn how to code with Python using the TI CX2 technology. This is the second of a series of three webinars focused on coding in Python with the CX2 handheld. I see that many of you are joining us for the first time, so we'd like to offer a special welcome if this is your first T-Cubed Professional Development Webinar. We'd also like to thank everyone for completing the live survey on the right side of your screen. My name is Stacy Thibodeau, and I will be the moderator for this event. I have been in the science classroom for 20 years. I currently teach at Southside High School in Youngsville, Louisiana where I teach all levels of Chemistry 1 and 2, and I'm so lucky to have an Introduction to Robotics class. I use TI technology to assist my teaching, data collection, and modeling math concepts, linking them to science content, as well as the TI Innovator Hub for my robotics program. We are lucky to have two panelists tonight, Tony and Andy. Tony Norell has only over 25 years teaching experience from fifth grade to college algebra. She retired as a math specialist at ESC Region 2 and is currently a T-cubed regional instructor and owns Norell Mathematics Consulting. She is a recipient of the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. Tony enjoys working with math teachers to help integrate technology in their classrooms. Thank you for being with us tonight, Tony. Thank you, Stacy. I'm excited to be here and do some more Python tonight. We also have Miss Andy Parr. Andy has been working in mathematics education since 1999. She has taught pre-algebra through AP statistics. She currently lives in Central Texas and serves as a math specialist working with middle and high school math, computer science, and STEM teachers. Thank you for being with us here tonight, Andy. Hi, I'm happy to be here and excited for all the conversations we get to have tonight around coding and Python. We are expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send questions to all panelists using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We will also send general messages in the chat window. And this session is being recorded. As a reminder, we will provide a link to this event's certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. Once the recording is available, if you'd like to follow along with your handheld or software, and we hope you will, we recommend doing this with the recording so you can download the activities and pause and rewind the recording as necessary. We don't expect you'll have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting communicate in the WebEx menu, audio broadcast, and then click join. And we have Andy, who is going to go over the agenda. Again, looking forward to a great evening. We'll go through just again, our introductions as we've done our, uh, we're going to work through control structures, specifically looking at for loops and while loops. And throughout everything, we're going to be talking about what would this mean in your classroom, looking for those opportunities to incorporate the inspire CX 2 using Python. And then at the end of our time together, we're going to do a, just a brief overview, just dipping our toes into the list. Thank you, Andy. Tony, if you want to go over the expected outcomes. Okay, thank you, Stacy. So I can capitalize on features of the Python editor and the Python shell and utilize the vocabulary driven menu for syntax structure of loops and lists and then create, run, and debug a program in Python. Thank you very much, Tony. 
We will also have a drawing later this, this evening for a T-Cube summer workshop. So be on the lookout for that. Just in case you missed it initially, if you do have any questions or want to chat throughout the night, we ask that you use the chat window and click on everyone. All right, Andy, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right. So give me just one second so I can share. Andy, I'm going to go ahead and kind of recap what we did in the first webinar, if that's okay, while you're getting ready. That's great. So um, on that, on our first Python webinar, we um, focused on creating a function in Python. We used formal and actual parameters or arguments with our function. And we also learned to use input statements so that the program would ask for information from the user while it was running. And we put all of those skills together to write a program that averaged grades, and then we enhanced the program. And then we thought of ideas to even enhance it further. So one of my questions is, if you were on that first webinar, um, did you add anything to that averaging grades program? And if so, tell us in the chat, um, or did any of you write a program, maybe using a formula that you might use in your classes after seeing how to write the average grades formula program? Tell us about that in the chat. I remember, Andy, we kept thinking of more and more ways that we could enhance that um, averaging grades program. We did. We did. So, so I'll give you just go ahead. I was going to ask you. So what are we doing tonight? So tonight we're going to look at loops and with doing loops, that's going to help our program become more efficient and we can do more things once we know how those loops work. That sounds great. Um, so, Andy, before we start on loops, I have a question. Um, asking for a friend on the handheld and the software. If one was to get him or herself into an infinite loop, how would one perhaps get out of it? Yeah, no, we never get caught in infinite loops and have it going over and over and over and over and not stopping. But in case you do, I say that purely in jest because it happens to me um, more often than I would care to admit. But if you're on the handheld, press and hold the on button. And then that will stop the program and help you out there. If you're on the software on a PC, press F12 and hit, hit enter repeatedly. And if you're using the software on a Mac, press F5 and enter repeatedly and then you'll be back on track and be able to start debugging the program and figure out what happened. That sounds great. Thank you, Andy. Absolutely. So again, I'm going to be using my software and modeling through it uh, as we go along. And from your home screen, let's start. Let's just start from the beginning. Start with a brand new document. So from the home screen. Pressing that on for the home screen, I'm going to press one for a new document. And now that you have the new document, you have Python there as that option a, and we want a new Python. Program document, so what we're going to do is we're going to start and let's just let's be super creative and call it loops. And from that. I we're going to start with a for loop. And I know I'm going to you want to use some math in this program. And so what I want to start with is from that menu. I want to use math, so I'm going to go ahead and import the math module. That frees up a lot more options for me as I go along. And Andy, as we can you show us that one more time? You went to the menu. I did. So from the. The math import or from the beginning, uh, just the math import where you found that. Yes, so I will in everything you'll find just about everything you need in menu. And if you go to menu, 
and then option five, which is math. And I brought from the math import and that way throughout my program, if I want to use any of those features, I can. Great. Thank you. As we did with uh, last time we met, I'm going to go ahead and create a function. So, again, I'm going to go to menu. These are built ins. I do want a function and I'm going to define it. What's great about going through the menu is it gives those. Uh, those blocks, those hints of telling you which, what do you need in each of those segments? And it also takes care of any of the syntax that uh, you're going to need. So for this, I'm going to define the function again. I'm going to call it loops. My argument in this case, I'm going to call it in. And now we are into this block and again, I want to create a for loop. So, to create a for loop, you got it. I'm going to go to menu. It is still built in and it is now under control and with control, you see, you have lots of options for for loops. For what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to go ahead and I want, I want all of it in there. So for index in range, where does it start? Where does it stop? And what do we want to count by? And now I just need to fill in those spots index, pick a variable by convention. We choose I. What do we want to start? Let's start with 1. Where do we want to stop? I want to stop. Up to, but not including N. And what is my step count? What are my increments? What do I want to count by? And I want to count by 1. So, now that we're in this for loop. What do I want it to do? What do I want it to repeat and iterate through? And I actually want to have an output. I want a print statement. So again, going to menu. It is part of built ins and I said out. We wanted an output. We want a print statement. So go to input output. And there's my print statement with all of the structure I need to it. And you'll notice that that print statement is indented again. So it's within that for loop. I want to print I and I squared. So to put the squared, I can. Beautiful thing about the inspire uh, CX2 is if I want the squared, I can press that squared button and it will use the correct. Uh, Grammar or put it in the syntax for Python for me. I could have very well, if I didn't want that, if I was on my keypad or my keyboard, my computer keyboard, I can use my keyboard as well, and that works. So, lots of options there. That's all I want to do. And now I need to call the program. Call, sorry, call the function. So I called this function loops and it is waiting for that argument. And just for kicks, let's go ahead and say we want to end to be 100. Okay, Andy, before we run this, can we kind of go back through the steps again and make sure that I understand exactly how this um, for loop is working? So. Up at the top, you defined a function named loops. You named your function loops. Correct. And then that in, you just chose a variable in, and that that's our formal argument. Correct. Excellent. Good use of your vocabulary. Thank you. I learned that in the first webinar. And so, um, so then you start the for loop, and so we usually use I for a loop, and we're going to start at one 
and we're going to stop at whatever value n is, and we're going to count by ones. And then what we want to happen in that loop is we want it to print i and i squared. So I'm thinking like the first time through, i is one. So I'm thinking it's going to print one comma one, and then the next, and then it's going to print two comma four, and so forth. And so because you chose 100 as your actual argument, then it's going to go through that loop 100 times. It is, let's see what it looks like. Okay, got it. Let's check. All right, so when you're ready, you can either go to menu and run, and you'll see run, it gives you the shortcut or the quick keys, I prefer calling them quick keys, of control R. Again, menu driven, vocabulary driven, you can go to menu. I did this time in the future, I'm probably just going to press control R. So when you press control R, it's going to take us into the shell and run that program. And look at it go. And it stopped at 99 because it's going to go up to, but not including that value of n. Oh, so that's interesting. So even though we said 100 in the for loop, it goes from 1 up to 100, but not including 100? Correct. So now that question is, is what is that final value? What is the final value? Because it iterated through, what is that final value if we're printing of I? Well, let's check. So I'm coming back to my program. I'm pressing enter. I'm going to go back to that print statement. The question, could I type this? Yes, you can. Yes, you can, but with your students, so if you're using your handheld, it becomes sometimes it's a little more cumbersome to type on that keyboard. And so that menu, the menu options are there that help greatly. So I'm going to say, I'm going to put a string that final value. And I want to know of I. Now, interesting point. Will this give me my final value? Right now, because it's in the for loop, it's going to print I, I squared final value is. I, I squared final value is. So I needed to get out of that for loop. And that's that great part of that indentation where you can see, am I in the for loop or am I in the function or out of the function? So now that you've only indented it twice, you're out of the for loop, but you're still within the function. Excellent, yes. Okay. So now let's run it one more time. Now I'm gonna press that control and R. And again, it just confirms that it goes up to, but not including. So with for loops, you have lots of options. There's a great opportunity for when it comes in handy. At the end of the webinar, we're gonna see that for loop come back a little bit. Um, but now what I would like to do is I'm gonna go back to my home screen and I'm gonna create a new document and again, we have a short amount of time together, so we want to kind of hit the highlights of lots of options. And let's talk about how a while loop works. And I'm seeing some conversations in the chat uh, leading to that. The for loop, it marches right through. I'm going to create a new document. It's going to ask me if I want to save it. It's fabulous work. I'm very proud of myself. But in this case, I'm not going to keep it. But now I'm going to add a new Python application. And this one, I'm going to call this one. What am I going to call this one? How about uh, 
wild loop. Wild, super creative. <laughs> wild loop. Um, Andy, I have a question real quick. If you can press cancel right there. When you go to that new document, so if someone is using a CX2, either a CX2 or a CX2 CAS, and you go to uh, a new document, if they don't have a add Python, it may be that their um, operating system is not up to date, even if it's a new, even if it's a new handheld, right? Because this is a relatively new operating system. Correct. So if you have a CX2, again, whether it's CAS or not CAS, that's not um, doesn't really matter with what we're doing today. Uh, if you don't have that add Python, even if it's again, just like Tony said, even if it's brand new, you're going to want to update your software. And then once you update it, then you'll have this option. Or your handheld, right? Your software or your, or your handheld, handheld, either one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for that clarification. So again, I'm going to do new. I'm going to call it while underscore loop. If you're on your handheld, you can press shift and the space key, and that will give you the underscore. And press OK. Getting into while loops, um, I noticed in the chat we're asking about that changing and increasing that increments, increasing those values. This is where that we were kind of alluded to those infinite loops beforehand with while loops. If you don't increment, then you're going to get caught in an infinite loop. So, Tony, will you go ahead and put those fixes in the um, chat one more time for me? Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good to know. <laughs> yes, yes. So, let's start off with just a uh, while loop with just a couple of lines. And what we need to start with is you've got to initialize the variable. So with a for loop, we said, I want you to start here and stop here and count by. With a while loop, it is that idea of a while loop will continue as long as your condition is being met. So you need to initialize a variable to begin with so that you can enter the loop. And if I'm if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, let's Let's put this to the test. Let's try it a little bit and then it will uh, start to clear up a little. So, in this case, I'm going to initialize a variable. I'm going to call mine K and I'm going to say K is equal to 1. Okay. Okay. So, we do that because we don't know. Uh, we don't know what value K has at this time. We may have used K before and we don't know what value. Um, is stored in K. So we want to make yeah. sure, right, that we enter that while loop. Yeah, we, yes. So we need okay. to say, if I'm going to check a condition is true and I'm involving K, then I need to tell you what K is to begin with. Okay. Again, I'm going to go to menu. I am going to go to those built ins. This is a control. And right there, in this case, it's option eight is a while loop. And again, it gives you that structure while some Boolean expression, some comparison is where we put there a true or false. Then it's going to do something within that indented block. And so, in this case, let's just say that we want K to be less than or equal to 5. Less than or equal to, I can um, type it out in lots of different ways. What I so appreciate is the fact that if I use my relational keys, so control equals, there is all of my options, which is in Python syntax. So there's my less than or equal to five. Because I use the menu, the colon is there. And I'm going to print. Oh, see, and I was going to start typing, but I really want to make sure I use that menu. So built ins, input, output, and print. And so I want to print K. 
And so Andy, you almost typed print. If I knew uh, Python syntax, I could just type it, correct? Absolutely, you can. But the and menu is there for people like me that need to make sure that my syntax is correct, to make sure that I know there's parentheses around the K and there's a colon after the less than or equal to five and so forth, because I don't know all the syntax of Python. Right. So this allows for that multiple entry points. If you want to use everything with the menu and the syntax is taken care of, great. If you have been coding for a good while and you know the language itself and all the syntax that's needed, if you want to type, type away. It allows for either one of those options or a mixture of both. Okay, now I'm looking at this. So while K is less than or equal to five, which I know it is, it's one, it's going to print K. But how is it going to stop printing K is equal to one? So right now, if I don't add anything else, this is the this is what an infinite loop means because K is at this point, if nothing else changed, K will always equal one because we've never said for K to change. So this, and uh, thank you for adding that in the chat. Now I need to say K is equal to K plus one, which means whatever K was before, add one to it. So it enters the, it enters the while segment. One, is that less than or equal to five? Yes, okay, proceed. Print, increment, by one, now K is equal to two and it's gonna go back up and cycle around. So at this point, we are ready, unless I've missed anything, Tony, are we ready to run this program? It looks pretty good to me. Okay, so let's hit control R and it did exactly what we said. We wanted as long as it's less than or equal to five, we are going to print it. Right. All right. So let's, that's great, but that's. That's so, 25 well, numbers. Yeah. So what if we, can we do another like while loop program? Cause I know whiles can do some pretty cool things. Um, maybe that has like an input statement that we did in the 1st webinar or something like that. Sure, sure. And yes, when we did input statements in, so let's go ahead and pull that in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go here to doc and insert a problem. So doc insert problem. And the reason I'm doing that again, I'm going to call it add Python and I'm going to call this one. Let's just call it valid. So what you'll notice is now it went to 2.1 and that way I can look back at this original while loop if I want, but nothing in this. Andy, yes. since you're looking back, um, Angela wants to know, can we use K plus equal one instead of K equal K plus one? Well, you absolutely can. So let's control R and it works. So yes. Right. You can do that and that would be great. So I like to insert a problem rather than inserting a page and that way it keeps every, all the variables and everything it keeps them on to themselves. And so they don't interfere with each other. Um, all right, we talked about input values, right? Mm -hmm. So let's ask, let's create a program that says, I want to keep, I, I want to know, ask for a positive number. And again, we're just um, creating one of them. And then we're going to talk about different ideas of what you can do in different scenarios. So let's say I want to keep asking for a number until I get a positive number. I want to make, see if uh, my user can give me a positive number. So okay. I call that in. And I'm asking for a number specifically, I'm asking for an integer. And so I want to specify that. 
So if you know that integer is int for int, you can type it, or I'm going to go to menu, built-ins, and type, and use it that way. Again, either way works. So now I want input. So I'm going to go again, menu, built-ins. If I want that input, then I'm going to use that menu for input output. And I'm specifically wanting input. Now, in this case, I need to move over one. So I'm within that input and I want to ask, and since I'm asking as a string, I'm going to say in a positive number. And put a space, parentheses. It's green, which I love the color coding. It just speaks to my heart. So you're asking for a positive number and you're expecting an integer and it's going to store it in n. I like the way you said that. Okay, great. I'm with you. All right, so now let's create that while loop. So menu, built-ins, control, and it's right where we found it last time of a while loop. And when this case, I'm asking for a positive number, but what happens if I don't get one? I want to keep, I want to keep asking. So I'm going to do this one. It says while I don't get a positive number. If I don't get a positive number, that means that n is less than or equal to zero. Okay. Okay. So that means whatever n is, if it is less than or equal to zero, which means it's negative. So what, what do I want to do? Well, I, I want to, yeah, it tell them it, that's not a, that's not a positive number or you yeah, that's not a positive, a positive number. number. Okay. So print input output. And I'm going to say that is not a pause. Spelled right. That is not a positive number. So the question becomes, what, what next? Great. I've asked for a positive number. My, the user has given me negative four. Well, negative four is less than or equal to zero. So I'm going to say that's not a positive number. So do you want to ask for a positive number again? I do. I do. And in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrow up and I'm going to press shift and I'm going to copy all of that on my handheld. I'm going to press or software. I can press control C and come down to where I want and press control B. So if you're on the handheld, you can you can copy and paste on the handheld. How do you do that again? I can come, I can use my arrows up. I can hold down the shift key. And this is the one time you want to hold the shift key and the right arrow and highlight anything you want. And then you would press control C. And then when you get to where you want the control C for copy, control X for cut, and where you want to be, then control V for paste. All right. So in this case, it is identical. I'm going to ask again. So let's try and see if it works. So what happens here? So you said it's going to keep asking for a positive number. If you don't put a positive number, what happens if you do put a positive number? So if I do put a positive number, it is not entering this while loop at all. 
could I put something down here? Absolutely, you can. I need to get out of the while loop. I'm going to print. Yes, that is a pause. What type of number? Does that work? Let's try it. Let's try it. So in our positive number, let's do negative so, four. Yeah, let's not put one in. Okay. Okay. Let's try that. That did exactly what we wanted. Good. Zero. Nope. Still not. How about seven? And that did exactly what we wanted it to do. Neat. So as long that was going to keep going in that while loop, as long as we weren't putting a positive number in. Correct. The way Correct. that we um, set that up. So it kind of has a game like feel to it. At the beginning stages of uh, and think of different things that you, oh, Marissa, great question. What if it's not a number? Mm. Let's try it. Let's try, I don't know, H. And it yelled at me. It yeah. bust. And that's because we put that I and T in there, right? So we specifically told it to be expecting an integer. Right. And it tells us in syntax for the integer. And we were, because right up here, we asked specifically for an integer. And okay. that's a great question and a great opportunity. And I would tell this with my students. And as you create the programs, can you break it? Can you cause it to have issues? And then what does that tell you? Right here, if we had H, if we gave it something um, else, then it's going to tell me that's not what I asked for and give an error. So each time we work on that, we would get the program to be more and more robust, right? We try to figure out all the ways that we could break it so that we could add things to it that would avoid that. Maybe Absolutely. we should have put um, enter a positive integer earlier. Maybe that would have, you know, helped. Yes, and make sure we're clear. Mm -hmm. And then we would have to do that here as well. And so the other part of this is making sure we have while n is less than or equal to zero, because we don't want, I've done this before, and we just let n, n be less than zero. Well, then what happens if you put zero in? Um, and so then can you can I'm change it from there. Can we take a second and look at this screen? Because I, I'm noticing that some people are having trouble. They, they've got everything down, but it's not giving them um, the, uh, the output that they were expecting. And so I'm wondering if it has anything to do with the indenting under the while loop, like mm -hmm. what's indented that first print and that input are under the while, but that last print is out of it, right? Once, once you do give a positive integer and it jumps out. So I want to give everybody time to look at this and compare it to what they have and see if they can figure out why they're not getting the, um, the output that they were expecting. So that's exactly right. that. Again, this these little diamonds help show what's within each structure. So within this while loop, we have a print and an input. And once you are come out of the while loop, then it goes to the next part of the program, which is a print statement.
Okay. So Andy, you kind of talked about how this was similar to what a game would look like because you're asking and um, you're asking for input and then you're creating that while loop. So do you have anything that's similar to a game that you can show us that might be something we could use? Um, even Absolutely. In so let's let's talk about that and then and also with this talk about different ways that you could potentially use this in your classroom. And so what we're going to do is I have we have this program that has been created. And I really just want us to look through it and as we look through it. Um, let's kind of talk about what's happening. So, right now we start. Initializing that variable and we're calling this variable score again. It doesn't have to be a single letter. You can use words. So, we're letting the score be 0. And then once we say, okay, the score is 0. We're going to start with that a while loop. And again, while that's true. We're going to, it lets us enter it right away. So now we're going to have this next line is that X is assigned a random integer between negative 12 and 12. Okay. So okay. it's going to generate a random integer for us. Yes. From, and call and, it X. And, yes. And put it in X. Okay. And I like, I think this is really neat because we did while true. We didn't do like less than or equal to or greater than or anything like that. So while, right. while this, while it's true, whatever we're about to do, this thing is going to keep running, right? Yes. Okay. 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 And so, and you'll notice that the name of this is Q root game. So we are going to ask for input. So we have an input statement here. We're asking for input specifically an in int. We're calling it user answer. And we're asking what is the Q root? Now you can't see the rest of it yet. I'm going to scroll to the right. But what is the Q root? And this is this is pretty slick. I like the way that this is happening. We've generated a number between negative 12 and 12. But we're asking for the cube root of x times x times x. Okay, so if it generated between negative 12 and 12, if it generated the number 2, then it's going to say, what is the cube root of but it's not going to tell us 2 times 2 times 2. It's going to tell us what is the cube root of 8. It will it's actually going to ask us for that value. It okay. will. And what tells us that is you notice that it, it's not green. It's not a string. Originally, it starts with x times x times x. That computation. And then it's saying, whatever this is, turn it into a string. And then concatenate this green, that value, which is now a string, and that question mark to make a, st a sentence. So we had to make the x times x times x a string because we can only concatenate strings. Correct. Okay. All right. That's a great way to make sure that. It all concatenates the way we want it to. So when it generates that X, that random integer, it's actually generating the answer that it wants us to tell them. But we're it's not using that to create that. that question, that answer. Yes. Okay. Okay. I think I'm with you. Okay. So we're saying, what is a cube root of whatever that val random value is that occurred? Multiply it um, times itself three times. Turn it to a string and make a question out of it. Okay. Okay, so let me scroll back. So let's say that integer was two. And so it said, what is the cube root of eight? Correct. So if 
the user answer is two, if that's what my X is, right? Right. Print correct. Then I get correct. Congratulations, you got it right. And then our score is gonna take whatever it was before and add one to it. Okay. Because we and got so it that's right. Still a true statement. So I'm gonna go back up here and I get another chance. And if I get it correct, I go back up here and get another chance. And I get one that I go, ooh, I don't know that one. I'm gonna guess. And what I guessed, my my user answer did not match the random number. So else, th that's no longer a true statement. That's a false statement. It's going to tell me I'm incorrect. It's going to tell me what the correct answer is. And I'm out of the while loop because now it's no longer true. It is false. And I will get my final score. Okay. So that's okay, pretty ready cool. to try it. Yeah, that's pretty cool the way that, that it used X, you know, because yeah, that random I, I integer. It. Yeah, that random integer that it generated is the actual answer to the cube root. Okay, I think I'm with you. Okay. I don't know if I know all my cube roots, but I think I'm with you. Well, between the two of us, um, let's try it. Okay, we have a question. Okay. So up there where it says, if user answer equals equals x right the double so equal this is a check right above it we had a, a singular or a one equal sign mm -hmm. assigning that input to you the variable user answer okay so that's assigning a value to a variable correct but on the equals equals we're doing a comparison Yes, just like we had that less than or equal to or greater than or equal to here. It is that um, relational key and we are checking. So we have the double equals. Okay. Okay. So now control R or go to menu run. And what is the cube to run? Oh, I'm so glad we started with that. Yes. <laughs> I can do it. What is a cube root of negative 729? I'm going to say negative 9. I hope somebody will help us out in the chat. Oh, good. Whew. Negative 8. Okay, we'll do, we'll do it. So at this point, you know, you can keep going. I'm going to say this one is, let's just say it's 3. It told me that I was incorrect, gave me that correct answer, and told me the final my final score. I like this. I like this a lot, Andy. And I'm thinking about my classroom. If I were doing cube roots or if I did something similar to this, a program similar to this with maybe a different um, topic, I could see maybe having stations where you know um where students have different activities but one of the stations is this program that they run this little game that they play if they're checking their cube roots absolutely so you could adapt this to what you need and i saw the can we keep um right now this is a singular a singular user if you wanted different users you could enhance this and build this out as robust as you can imagine and wanted to uh, play with the code and make that. But this is uh, just like you're saying at a station, I wanna check to see if I know and I'm getting that immediate feedback. It's not just telling me you're it's wrong. It's also telling me that's incorrect, but here's the correct answer. So in my case, it was supposed to be a negative three rather than a positive three. That's great. And we have a score and we all like getting a score, right? So we can 
compare our, our scores that we as long as it's good it. i like it <laughs> <laughs> and so right. um, again you'll notice that in this one we used a cube root rather than a square root think of the implications of how would you potentially want to change your random integers if it was finding square roots Lots of things to uh, think through as you um, would create your version of it and adapt it the way that you would like to. Neat. I like the way that was written. Excellent. Did I miss any questions? Are we? I think we're good. Okay. So we want to do, and we just have a couple of minutes left, but I really would like for us to try one more thing. And then I'm going to add, oh, I'm going to press my home screen for me. I'm going to create a new document. I'm going to go into Python again to have it new. And I'm going to call this one list. And so with list, list gives us lots and lots of options. Um, it, it's a collection of information. And we define list using brackets. We can even start with an empty list. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do I want to do that now? We'll do it right here in the um, pro, Python editor. Okay. So I could do everything I'm about to do and I could do it in the shell. But right now, let's just go ahead and do it in the Python editor. I could create, I'm going to call it my list. And I'm going to have it be using the brackets. Let's call it, put a three in on my list. I'm going to put an A in my list. I'm going to put the number eight and I'm even going to put the number nine just because I feel sparky. Okay, Andy, I have a couple of questions already. All right. Uh, where, did, where did you where do you find those square brackets on the handheld? You find the square brackets on the handheld left hand column. If I hit Control and then the left parenthesis, there are okay. brackets. Okay, got it. And um, I noticed that you put the A in quotations. I did. And again, with Python, we can use either a single qu quotation or a double quotation. It really doesn't matter, um, but you need to be consistent. So in here, if I'm going to use a double quotation on the left of it, I need to use a double quotation on the right. But we and we put it in quotations because it's a string. We didn't want it to put the value of A in the list. We wanted it to put A, the letter A. Correct. Correct. And can. Can you show me again where the quotations are on the handheld? On the quotations on the handheld? Lots of ways. In fact, let's do it one more time. I'm going to create a list for you and okay. I'm going to call it your list. And on your list, I'm um, again that quotation or control and the left parentheses for my bracket. I'm going to type in negative three. And I'm going to use those quotations now. Let's put another string in there. So I'm going to do control. And right here at the multiplication sign is an option. It's not the only option, but it is an option. Okay. And this time I'm not going to just use a, I want to call it, have a string called apple. And the number five. Okay. Okay. So right now, let's just say I want to print my list. So if I go to menu, built-ins, and input output of print, I can print my list. Oop, extra. Okay. At this point, let's run it. Let's see what happens. I am, if I did it right, I'm hoping then I'm going to print 3, A, 8, and 9. OK. 
Okay. Excellent. It did exactly what I wanted it to. And you have lots of options. I can add a value into my list or your list, doesn't really matter. So I'm going to use, I want to add a value. So my list, if I go to menu and I come in here to built-ins and list, I have so many options, tons of options. And with our four minutes we have left, uh, we can't go through all of those options. But we can, I'm going to use, let's just look at a little bit. I'm going to use a pen. You also notice your brackets are right here. Okay. So if you're talking about list you, and you don't remember which one you need, come and list and it will help you. And it's asking for that item. What item do I want to add into my list? So let's add 14. So you want to, to put 14 after the number nine. It is. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Let's see if that works. How will I know? Do I need to print it out again? You can. So I'm going to come up here. I'm going to hold my shift key down. I'm going to print my list. Control C for copy. Control V for paste. I can print it again and see it. And let's run it. Oh, there it goes. Excellent. That's what I wanted. But let's so say Andy, that I just wanted to print one element, and this time I am going to type. Okay. I just wanted to print one element from my list. And I want to print the fourth element. So my question in the chat is what what is going to be printed for this final print statement? What am I going to see? Oh, and I noticed you use brackets instead of parentheses. I did. I did because I want the fourth element. Element. So, so if I just count one, two, three, four in your original list, the fourth element would be nine. But right. I'm thinking that's not right. I don't know. Let's try. Okay. So let's hit control R. And it printed my original list. It printed my list with 14 added to it. And then it printed 14 again. And the reason for that is because you count starting with zero. So this okay. is zero, one, two, three, four. So the fourth element of your list is 14. Yes. So you would always index is, is at zero. And that is different from if you were coding in TI basic. Okay. TI yeah. basic started at one, a lot of, I'm not going to say all by any stretch of the imagination. It's not uncommon for indexing to start at zero. At zero. Okay. Okay. So um, with that, there's tons of things you can do with that. I would like us to, though, just, I'm just going to give you a glance at things we can do with the list. And we're going to look at this next time we meet. And we're going to be looking at the hub. And you'll notice here we have list and we're adding lists together and we have a for loop and all sorts of great things. Nice. So just, just as a teaser for that's what we're going to be looking at next time we're together. Great. Thanks. Wow. So much information. Thank you, ladies, so much. Andy and Tony, this was another intense um yet i have so many ideas of things i want to try with my students when um i actually start with the the python with them in the fall right <clears throat> so for tonight
for your certificate of attendance, if you click on the link that's in the chat, um, you can get your certificate of attendance. It will also be emailed to you in a couple of days um, so that you guys that are watching this on demand can actually get it as well. I mentioned earlier that we're going to have a webinar drawing. Um, a drawing, excuse me, for a T cube summer workshop and congratulations. It is David Stevens. David, someone will from TI will be contacting you within the next couple of days and talking to you about your T cube summer workshop. Um, as always, stay connected with TI, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest. Um, do what you can to stay connected with people, especially with summertime coming up. Um, having these three different sessions um, helps us to kind of keep things moving along throughout the summer. You will receive a uh, survey link when you conclude with this webinar. If you don't mind, please fill it out. This gives TI lots of information on um, how to better uh, the quality of the products as well as what you thought was great for the, the webinar tonight. Um, there is one last uh, learning to code with Python technology part three. It is July 14th. Um, if you've registered for it already, awesome. Um, Andy and Tony hinted that we're going to be doing some innovator hub, which is what I do with my students. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and then at the same time, um, we'll sp spend some more time doing some lists. So thank you guys. Thank you, Andy, Tony, as always, it's always great working with you guys. Um, and I hope you guys stick around for our July session. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you in July.